Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, we have a presentation uh, with you today with several members of our uh, PPSD um, community here within the district. Uh, we have several slides that we will be uh, walking through, uh, presenting different areas uh, of priorities. Um, towards the, the middle of the presentation or towards the end, we'll have a set of questions that we will ask all, uh, which will help us engage in a discussion through our uh, question and answer feature. Before we go there though, we need to uh, talk a little bit about norms. Uh, and I also wanna take a quick moment to introduce uh, my colleague, Janet Pachado. Say hello, Janet. Hey everyone. Uh, Janet is part of the uh, FACE team uh, and will be helping me with some of the uh, translation pieces here in the beginning. Uh, we also do have uh, Spanish translators available for those who, uh, who need them. Let me go to the next slide. Yeah, we'll remind all panelists to uh, speak slowly when you're doing your presentation uh, on your section so that uh, the translator has the opportunity to keep up with the information that you're sharing. Uh, and also ask for your patience as the slides uh, tend to be a little slow going from one uh, to the next, more of a, a technical piece. All right, so here's some of the norms for the presentation. I'll share what we have here in English, and I'll ask my colleague, Janet Pichardo, to translate um, the Spanish portion. So this presentation uh, will be a webinar format. You will not be able to see each other, only us, the panelists, up on the screen. Everyone that's on here will try to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, we have an hour from uh, 5.30 to 6.30. We realize that um, we may not be able to get to all the questions, uh, but do understand that we are keeping track of all the questions that are asked of us. And we will uh, try to respond to as many of those as possible, either within the presentation here or, or afterwards. All right, microphones of all of the attendees will be muted and the session will be recorded and placed on our providenceschools.org website. Janet, I'll turn that over to you. Thank you. Para las personas que necesitan uh, esta presentación completamente en español, este, si miran su pantalla, por favor, si pueden seguir lo que le voy a leer. La presentación será un formato de seminario web. No podrán verse, solo los panelistas y el facilitador. Los, panelisti, los panelistas tratarán de responder el mayor número posible de preguntas y los micrófonos de todos los asistentes están silenciados. Esta sesión será grabada. Por favor, visiten al sitio web, como lo ven en la pantalla, www.providenceschools.com. Punto org. Y en un momento le dejamos saber cómo pueden acceder a la, al intérprete que está en esta llamada. All right, thank you very much, Janet. Right, so for when we get to the, uh, the question and answer session, um, you will have the opportunity to enter your question uh, into the Q&A button that you will see at the bottom of your screen. So write your question in the Q&A. The panelists will respond live or a res response will be given or will be provided in your question and answer box. Uh, for those that are interested in translation, Spanish translation, there is the globe down at the bottom of the screen, which you can click on to hear the presentation in Spanish. But I, Para las uh, personas que hablan español, abajo, eh, en, en, abajo en la página hay un globo que puede oprimir 
para uh, oír interpretación en español. Jenny, how did I do? You did fine. <laughs> uh, I just want to add one thing. Yep. Las personas um, de nuevo que van a acceder a la interpretación, uh, cuando presionen el globo, seleccionen el idioma español porque van a ver también la opción en inglés. Pero este, presionen el español y ahí va, van a entrar al canal completamente en español. Gracias. All right, muchas gracias, Janet. All right, so we'll head over to the next slide. All right, so uh, to kick us off, we have our wonderful superintendent, Dr. Javier Montañez, who is going to walk us through uh, the next couple of slides. Superintendent, it is all yours. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Nick. And I would like to say uh, good evening to everyone. Um, as Nick said, I am Dr. Javier Montañez. I'm the acting superintendent for Providence Public Schools. And I wanna say thank you for taking time out of your day to be with us here today. I want you to know, oh, and I remember I have to go a little slow. Okay. So I want you to know that as our community members, your voice matters to us and your input will be key to the success going forward. So today, we're gonna to provide you with details on the latest round of the federal funds at PPSD. We will be receiving this summer. This way, we can have meaningful conversations about how to use these funds to make sure our students succeed. At the end of this presentation, you will be invited to take a brief survey to help your child's schools improve. I encourage, please, I encourage everyone to take part in that. Your voice matters. So have you heard the term URSA three a few times already today? But what does it really mean? Thank you to the American Rescue Plan. School districts around the country are receiving funding to address the impact of COVID-19 on our students. We use the funds to address our students' academic, social, emotional, and mental health needs. This fund is known as URSA, which is short for elementary and secondary school emergency relief. Today, we're discussing the third rounds of federal funds. So it, it's known as ERSA three. Next slide, please. This time around, PPSD will be receiving roughly $130 million in ERSA three funds this summer. Our deadline to spend the money is the end of the year 2024-2025 school year. After that, any monies that's not used will go back to the government. So this is even more of a reason to make sure that as we move forward, hearing your voice, putting this work, this money to work for our children, it counts. We do not want to send any money back when we can help our children uh, achieve and accelerate in learning. PPSD will be dedicating approximately 80% of its funds to learning, equity, and accelerated pathways which is known as LEAP. This will help ensure that students reach grade level mastery and above. Next slide, please. Here's a breakdown of the areas where PPSD plans to invest this money. As I mentioned, LEAP resources make up the majority to help us accelerate students' growth and most importantly, 
eliminate that achievement gap. The remaining monies will be divided to ensuring that health and wellness of our students and staff, recruiting and retaining world-class talent, and most importantly, engaging you, our families. But since LEAP will make up 80% of our investments, let's take a closer look at our priorities in these areas. And for that, I'm going to pass it over to Ms. Joan Jackson, my senior advisor. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent. Good evening, everyone. As the superintendent pointed out, we wanna make sure that we are using the bulk of these dollars to make sure that our students are growing academically and as well as socially and emotionally. So we are focusing on the following areas, which is improved attendance. We want to expand our use of data with the development of a real-time dashboard to be accessible for all of our stakeholders. We want to extend access of all of our programs for all students and extended learning opportunities for students. We are focusing on equity to eliminate that achievement gap. We are focusing on social emotional health world-class talent, and family engagement. These initiatives will supplement the work that we're doing to carry out our efforts to meet the goals of the Turnaround Action Plan. And you'll see as we go through this slide deck that we are looking at these areas and how they are aligned to the TAP initiatives. I'm going to pass over this now to Jennifer Carney, our Chief data and assessment officer. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. As we had mentioned, one of our first priorities is attendance. Student and staff attendance is a vehicle to improve student performance. These initiatives will support students and parents in reducing truancy by monitoring attendance patterns and providing incentives for students to attend school regularly. As Ms. Jackson mentioned, we have aligned our turnaround action plan or our TAP goals to our ESSER goals and areas for investment. The first priority TAP goal is in red. You will notice that some of these goals that are in red stand for the priority goals in the TAP. Excuse me, Jen, I'm sorry, your microphone is a little bit funny right now. I I will take the next this the rest of the slide. Maybe you could sign out and sign back in to see if that fixes it. So our tap aligned goal is to increase the percentage of students who are present 90% of the school year and increase the percentage of students who feel a sense of belonging in their schools. Our areas for investment include alternate and, ske and flexible schedule options, additional transportation options, and to continue and expand best practices to increase attendance as we've been doing with home visits, canvases, and school informational neighborhood meetings. Next slide, please. Great. And I will pass this back over to Jennifer Carney. Let's see if your microphone is better. How is this, Ms. Jackson, better? Perfect. Okay. Use of data. Meaningful assessment data will be collected and used to create a snapshot of what students know, what they should know, and what they do not know yet. These initiatives will provide teachers and leaders with the tools and knowledge to align and adapt instruction on an ongoing basis. The TAP goals aligned to this measure is to increase the percentage of principals 
who demonstrate turnaround school competencies. To increase the percentage of PPSD students enrolled in a two-star or higher school, and to increase the percentage of schools that have a school improvement team that meets state requirements. Possible areas for investment are accessible and user-friendly data dashboards for schools, teachers, students, and families. Professional development for teachers to create professional learning communities professional development for school leaders on data-driven instruction in interim assessment platforms. And finally, use data to support and inform school improvement teams. I will now hand the mic to uh, Dr. Yvonne Alvarez, Redesign and Innovation Officer. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. So in terms of our area of focus for access and extended learning, that will allow students to gain skills and knowledge outside of the classroom and outside of the traditional school day. These initiatives will support students as they acquire knowledge and apply it to real world situations. The top goals that align with that um, area of focus would be increasing the percentage of students who graduate within four years, as well as increasing the percentage of ninth graders who are on track for post-secondary success. The areas of investment that align with these TAP goals would be extending the school year and or school day, high quality rigorous district-wide summer learning programs, place-based learning and internships, RICAS and SAT boot camps, after school and Saturday Academy time to improve grades and make up credit and expand support in navigating the college admissions and career induction process. Next slide. The other area that I'll discuss is the equity focus priority area in which all students have access to opportunities that support academic success, fairness, and inclusion. These are identified teaching strategies and practices that will support equity initiatives. The top goals that are aligned with equity are increasing the percentage of students who feel a sense of belonging at their school, as well as increasing the percentage of families with a favorable perception of being involved with their child's school. The areas of investment that align with equity and the top goals would be culturally responsive teaching and high quality professional development embedded in project-based learning, college and career readiness, capacity building for family and community partnerships, additional translation opportunities for ELL and MLL students and families, and accessibility for just differently abled students, their families and parents with handicaps. And now I'll pass it over to Ms. Jackson. Thank you. We know the toll that COVID has taken on all of us, and especially it has hit our students extremely hard. Social emotional learning is part of a student's education and human development. SEL helps students acquire and apply the knowledge, skills, and attitudes to develop healthy identities and manage their emotions. It also helps students achieve goals demonstrate empathy for others, engage in supportive relationships, and make responsible decisions. The top goals that we are aligning to are increasing the percentage of PPSD students who graduate within four years, increase the percentage of ninth graders who are on track for post-secondary success, and increase the percentage of students who feel a sense of belonging at their school. Our areas of investment are to increase resources for behavior supports in each of our schools, increase the number of community involvement specialists in each of our schools, and implement positive behavioral support, intervention and supports in all of our schools. Next slide, please. The achievement gap refers to any significant and persistent inequalities in academic performance or educational attainment between different groups of students. 
These initiatives will reduce and close the achievement gap between groups of students, specifically focusing on underperforming minority students. Our top goals that we are aligning to are to increase the percentage of students meeting and exceeding expectations in third and eighth grade math and ELA on RICAS. To increase the percentage of students meeting and exceeding expectations on the math and ELA SAT. Increase the percentage of students who are meeting their annual MLL targets on the access assessment. And increase the percentage of students who graduate with college credit, AP credit, or CTE credit. Our areas for investment include increasing rigor with any adoption of high quality curriculum and materials. Adding a college advisement program, adding college advisement program counselors and access to accelerated courses. Adding college board advanced placement or AP courses. Additional multilingual, multilingual learner and differentially abled supports and opportunities and multi-tiered support system to ensure students' individual needs are met. Next slide, please. I think we missed one. Was there one before that, Janet? I'm going back now. Nick. Yep. This is Nick. Maybe, maybe mine are out of order. I will pass. Oh, no, okay. I think okay. that, yeah. So um, if you go back to family engagement, I will pass it over to you, Nick. Thank you very much. Oh, world-class talent, here we go. Sorry, oh, there was there one, go. there was one, yeah. Okay. Every school will be staffed with highly effective teachers and leaders. PBSD will recruit, mentor, and retain teachers through an equitable hiring process while developing external relationships specifically with higher education to strengthen teacher recruitment and retention. Our TAP goals are to increase the percentage of teachers who have access to job embedded professional development, increase the percentage of teachers holding and using the ESL BDL certification and increase the percentage of teachers who are present 90% of the school year. Our areas for investment are to expand professional growth opportunities for teachers and school leaders to create conditions for success. Summer teacher and principal academies. We are seeking to become Rhode Island's first in-house ESL certification program and data-driven professional growth opportunities to meet the needs of the staff. And now I will pass it to Nick for family engagement. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, these slides keep jumping ahead of me. Just give me one second. We'll go back to uh, my section here. All right, so as I try to figure out the, there we go, the technical piece. All right, uh, family engagement, the next area of priority. Um, all families, we want all families to be included, involved and engaged in their, in their students' learning uh, because we know it impacts development and wellness of the whole child. Um, looking at uh, students and, and academic achievement and uh, uh, well-being outcomes. Uh, we want to take a holistic approach and work with families to um, have families become uh, better engaged with the district and to give us an opportunity to hear uh, parent voices as well. So uh, some of our TAP goals that are aligned with this, um, uh, with this family engagement work is to increase the, the percentage of families with a favorable perception 
of being involved in a child's school. And obviously COVID uh, this last uh, two years has impacted the ability to have parents in buildings, uh, but we're, we're now moving towards having that uh, level of involvement, involvement back in our facilities. Uh, the next bullet, increase the percentage of PPSD families with a favorable perception of the district. And again, one of the ways that we do that is to enhance the way that we communicate with families and the way that uh, increase the ways that we can receive feedback from families. Increase the number of parents and caregivers engaged with the district's formal community engagement structure. So that can be the uh, Parent Advisory Council, the district-wide, uh, advisory council or the PTOs, PTSOs uh, that exist at uh, the schools. So some of the areas for uh, investment would be to find additional methods for uh, consistent and transparent family communication. So we currently use a Kimbo system to message out to families. We have our Let's Talk system, which allows us to receive feedback but we're always looking to improve and get better at communicating with our PPSD community. Uh, the next bullet, expand parent academy options for PPSD families to learn best practices of technology for public services to close the digital divide. And I know this is something that's important to all of us and is uh, just as important to the superintendent. He and I have had several conversations around this. Uh, we want to make sure that we're able to close that digital divide and uh, offer opportunities for uh, engagement in the parent uh, academy for our families. Districts uh, subscriptions for students to access digital books, libraries, newspaper publications in multiple language, multiple languages. Obviously, the more information we can have in our students' hands uh, will impact. Uh, the outcomes of their learnings. And lastly, support for families with translation services in 300 languages. So uh, we're, we're uh, trying our best to make sure that we have uh, adequate translation services for those that need uh, the services within the district. All right, so that was the last uh, slide of the presentation. What we like to do now is get into the, the Q&A button, uh, if you will. Uh, we have three questions that we're posing to uh, start off this conversation. Uh, please feel free to uh, add questions into the Q&A uh, uh, chat box. Uh, from there, we will go through the questions that are posted. Uh, keeping in mind that we may not be able to get to all of the questions uh, because of the uh, limited uh, time frame that we have. Uh, but please note that we are collecting all questions and we'll do our best if we don't answer those questions today uh, to answer them uh, via uh, the email that you uh, place into the system when you logged on to the Zoom. So the three uh, conversation starter questions are, uh, which priority area of focus does your child need the most to succeed? Question two, which of these initiatives will benefit your students and family the most? And then lastly, do you have any specific recommendations that align to these priorities, to the priorities that we spoke of uh, today? Um, as you're thinking about uh, the questions, you're formulating the questions and getting ready to put them into the chat box. Uh, would also like to say that we, uh, we will have a survey and we'll make that available shortly. Uh, this survey will give you the opportunity to uh, provide us with additional feedback on uh, this ESSER funding. Uh, any recommendations you may have, uh, you can post into uh, into the Q&A. Um, we ask that you will we'll put, I think the survey is already in the chat. Yes, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, you can actually uh, open that link so that you have the page in your browser or you can copy and paste uh, and put it right into your browser. This way, when the presentation is done, 
uh, you will be able to keep the survey open and complete it um, uh, on your own afterwards. Okay, so we'll, we will trans, uh, transition to uh, the Q&A and I will uh, sort through these questions here. Uh, the first one, uh, can you address how funds might be used to invest in safe, equitable, and accessible play spaces at all schools? So, uh, so you know, as I read these questions, the panelists uh, will determine uh, who would be best to answer these questions. So again, I'll, I'll repeat this first question. Can you address how funds might be used to invest in safe, equitable and accessible play spaces at all schools. Superintendent, would you so like I'm to? Gonna, yeah, I'm gonna jump in right now. Thank you, I was getting off of mute. Um, but, well, first of all, we have to look at, uh, always looking at the TAP and see what initiatives are aligned to, to these funds. Uh, this is the priority that we're looking at. I also noticed that part of that question uh, refers to my old school, um, the love of my life, Levington Do Language School. And um, I just want to say that I know that we, was, we have built the stage that's outside and also the areas for plants. Uh, we've also worked on certain designs on the ground, which, was, which were painted where community members came in. I think it was youth build that came in and they painted uh, areas where the students can actually play outside. I know it's asphalt out there um, and it's a really uh, small uh, recess area. Uh, so, so I know they don't have uh, equipment out there as to say as some schools who have a bigger uh, schoolyard where they have the monkey bars and the slides and all that. Uh, so that, that of course is an issue because of a uh, space constraint but also inside of the building itself, when the students go outside, they, they have their space where they can walk around or jog around. But when they're inside, I know that the, uh, the PE teacher also has a lot of activities that they do inside the building. Uh, as far as uh, how we're planning to use some of the URSA funds to do those kind of uh, equipment and um, play areas outside, it's not something that I, uh, I have thought about it right now, but it's something that I can actually uh, put in my parking lot. And then when I'm able to meet with my team, uh, we can uh, bring that conversation up. Thank you. All right, thank you, Superintendent. We'll move on to the next question. Okay, how can ESSA three funds be used to support the recruitment and retention of teachers, especially teachers of color, STEM educators, and teachers supporting students with diverse learning needs. So I'll jump in and then anyone after myself can jump in as well. This is Dr. Montanis again. Uh, so some of, some of the um, uh, steps that we have taken, it's first looking to hire uh, um, world-class talent teachers as we uh, continue to hire. One of the things that we have done is that we started hiring, working with the PTSO, I mean, I'm sorry, with the PTU. We was uh, given the opportunity to hire earlier. So that's one way of recruiting. Uh, also making sure that when we receive um, individuals who are coming from other states who want to work with our students, who represent our students, um, there's, there are incentives in place. Some, some additional uh, ways that we're using the funds for uh, retaining and, and doing professional development and helping teachers uh, be certified. Uh, so we're asking, um, because of the DOJ, we are asking all teachers to be certified with ESL. So we're actually giving teachers, we're able to pay teachers, it's almost $8,000 per teacher to receive their ESL certification. We're also using the monies for hard to fill spots, for example, ESL, dual language, science, um, differently able students 
So those are some, just some of the areas that we're using these funds to make sure that we're able, one, to bring in the best talent, two, the incentives is to help keep those individuals in Providence, and then three is making sure that we re they're receiving um, stipends for uh, accelerating their education and moving forward to receiving the ESL certification or one of the other certifications. I would also add that we have a um, expanded our HR staffing to include a staff member focused on solely on diversity and increasing our diversity in hiring. We're also looking at ways that we can um, support some of our <clears throat> teacher assistants. They're currently in the district to develop a, or get onto a path to become teachers within this district. Uh, hey. uh, can I just add, yep. you know, right do, do we want to also explain the uh, trying to get our license to be the first district uh, to have an in-house course for ESL certification? So that's a, an additional uh, pathway that we're using to uh, bring in talent and, and maintain and keep our talent here in Providence. All right, thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Next question. Where does increasing school mental health support by hiring more social workers and school psychologists per school fall in the plan? So I'll jump in again. Uh, so we have to, uh, just last year, well, the beginning of this year, uh, we have hired uh, social workers, uh, guidance counselors for each school, especially elementary, which never, never, um, we never really had a full-time social worker at, in those grade levels. Uh, so each elementary school has a social worker and a guidance counselor. And we also uh, brought in a community, community specialist in the middle and high school to make sure that we're using those individuals who are our homegrown from our community, working with us, reaching out to the students who um, are having difficulties uh, coming to school. So their purpose is to reach out and find out what are the barriers that's keeping students from um, coming to school. And uh, we try to help those individuals by finding solutions through the use of the community specialist. All right, thank you, Superintendent. Next question. Oh, give me one second. How can ESSER uh, 3 funds be used to support the ongoing training and professional development of educators especially with a focus on training teachers to better support multilingual learners and to engage students in culturally relevant and social emotional learning. I, I can jump in, but John, would you like to start? Well, I think that uh, the superintendent was speaking to our um, ESL training and coaching that we have on a daily basis in all of our schools, um, as well as we have submitted our application to RIDE to become um, our own uh, ESL certification body, which would be the first in the state. Um, and then I, I think I can let the superintendent speak to the additional pieces, but you know, our, our focus is on also the job embedded coaching. So while teachers are in their classrooms, we have coaches in the classrooms with them. And this, I'm sorry, and one other thing I do wanna add is this is a lens that we also have with our selection for any of our new curriculum that we are adding into the district. And as, uh, as far as uh, continue uh, professional development, we have added an additional five professional development days this year for teachers and as well as looking forward to our 
uh, some uh, academies for uh, principals and teachers as we move forward to making sure that we continue to develop their skills uh, so we can have the world-class talent with the teachers that we have here. And as we continue to hire the world-class talent, we continue to do professional development and at the district level. Okay, thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Next question. What types of transportation options exactly are you looking to establish? I'm not sure what they're asking, what kind of transportation. Okay, I believe this may have been from one of the slides. So I will ask that person if you could uh, uh, put in uh, a little more clarity around that question and we'll come back to that. Thank you. So our, I'm sorry, our, some of our transportation option is to look at if we are extending a school day okay. or doing um, different time options for certain students, exactly. this is where we're looking to ensure that we have the transportation to align with that. We also are trying, we have Saturday academies at academies. some of our schools. Um, we're looking at after school programming. So if we have tutoring after school, again, all of these to make sure that we are opening those opportunities for all students and then aligning our transportation with that so more students can participate. Okay. All right, thank you, Ms. Jackson. Next question, are there plans for bringing elementary after school programs? Hmm. Yes, so, again, this, uh, this goes along with our um, our work to expand, expand time. You know, we are looking at increasing time across the district. So we know that to mitigate the achievement gap, we have to have, go outside of just our traditional school day and increase their opportunities by at least 25%. So we're looking at after school, we're looking at summer, and we are looking at our Saturday academies, um, more ways that we can give our children opportunities to engage with those core academic areas to get them up to grade level. Superintendent, did you wanna add anything to that? I was just going to add that uh, we started uh, last summer. It was the first time in a very, very long time that uh, we as a district uh, uh, implemented the summer programs for uh, elementary students. And we plan to continue to do that to make sure that we continue to work on the achievement gap and help our, our students accelerate their learning. Okay, thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Next question. Can you please provide additional details on equity the area of investment, capacity building for family and community partnerships? Um, I can start that and I can also have uh, uh, Yvonne Alvarez uh, chime in as well. Um, we have been looking at equity across the district, meaning um, opportunities in our schools, looking at students that are significantly behind or uh, looking at our differently abled students, MLL students, um, and ensuring that they have the opportunities and the higher expectations that they need to succeed. Um, which is why our big move in our curricular areas is to increase the rigor because we know that the more, the, if we raise the bar, the students will rise up to that. So we're also looking at equity across our system. And so that's in HR and our hiring practices and how we are trying to attract um, people to our district. Um, it's also in the training of our staff to ensure that we are putting the best staff possible in front of our students. I'm gonna pass it over to um, Yvonne in case she wants to add more. Yes, thank you. So in terms of equity um, within the school, uh, the context of the actual school and not across just district systems, but um, talking about really improving the climate of inclusion for students, um, not only that sense of increased belonging and connectedness, but also 
um, making sure that you know students are exper- the student experience changes in terms of uh, reduction of incidents, um, whether they're harassment, bullying incidents, that we have um, increased positive student adult relationships, that we empower students to speak um, and tell us what their experience has been so that we can improve upon that. Um, as well as really when we, when one of the things in the equity slide was the implementation of culturally responsive practices and teaching. Um, and that really refers to critical thinking about how um, culture impacts the brain when we are teaching students um, of diverse backgrounds and then supporting our staff and our teachers to do the work within cultural competency, um, as well as leading those equity decision-making processes um, with our principals and supporting them and the ultimate outcomes, of course, focused on you know, looking at equitable disciplinary practices, um, equitable special education practices, um, equitable ELL, MLL uh, instruction practices, as well as looking at those achievement levels within different demographic groups, um, when there's a, a substantial difference between them and access to higher level um, courses, such as advanced placement or college level work acceleration and increased graduation rates of of our minority and underrepresented students. I would like to also just jump in and also think about uh, the other part of the question, which is speaking about our families and uh, Mr. Figueroa, uh, you can speak about the, uh, the, the family academy that we have, but also thinking, you know, what is it? What are, what are the expectations when our parents go walk into a classroom? I mean, into a building. How are they treated? How do they? What do they feel? What's the culture and the climate of the school? So we have to also keep that in mind because that is an important factor to me that our parents and our community is welcome one, and two respected. So not only is it for the students but also for our for our families. And uh, Mr. Figueroa, you might want to say a few words about the. Uh, the Family uh, Academy. Uh, Thank you, Superintendent. Yes, so uh, we're currently working on capacity building through our our parent university. Um, We're trying to build that up, um, you know, with each um, uh, semester that we have. Um, And so what we like to do is as as we think about uh, down the road, uh, particularly with our community partners in our our partner organizations, how can we work together to further build uh, that capacity of our families? Uh, We have to look at the the services that each organization uh, offers and then uh, build around that to uh, support family growth that uh, also impacts student uh, outcomes, uh, not just the academic outcomes, but the attendance outcomes as well in classrooms. So we are thinking about that. Uh, we are moving in that direction. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to get to a place where, uh, you know, we, we have some, some strong foundation around uh, family engagement and building families, again, as, as, a, as a holistic approach uh, to the work that we do. Okay, so uh, let me go to the uh, next question. All right, Uh, how are funds going to be used for summer engagement? Are grants going to uh, be available for summer programs? Uh, I think we just answered that on the oh, last did you? part I'm of the sorry. question. No, yep. no, I'm saying okay. it, it's it's similar to what we already explained on how we're using the funds for yep. uh, uh, Saturday academies or we are looking at summer summer programs, tutoring programs, after school programs. So yes, we are thinking um, of using these funds to um, to uh, work and and put it for students uh, in front of students and and putting programs that's going to help students one close the achievement gap and to help the students achieve and be successful. Okay, thank we you. Do, we are releasing our RFP, our summer RFP as well. Nick, would you like to speak to that? Yes, so we have a, a summer enrichment program 
Uh, we are going to be releasing uh, the RFP fairly soon, uh, within the next uh, week or so. Um, and the idea there is to provide some uh, summer engagement for students uh, with some of our community uh, partner organizations that will uh, focus not only on academics, but also the uh, social emotional component that's very important to our students. So we do have that in the works. And I think as we, again, as we're, we're planning forward, we're really going to try to expand these services so that we can impact uh, more students in the district. All right, so I have a, a more of a, not necessarily a question, but more of a, um, a statement, I suppose. It's in Spanish. I will do my best to try to translate it into English. Janet, help me out if I uh, miss anything. So uh, there's a parent here who is stating that uh, they need help uh, with uh, improving their child's uh, English ability or English speaking, and I imagine writing as well, ability. So I guess the question is here, what, what are we doing to uh, support uh, ESL students? Well, I, I would like to start by saying is that they are several, we, we as a district have several programs uh, aimed just for that reason, which is the ES, one is the ESL program. And this is why uh, going back to the, the release of the DOJ and saying that we were on the servicing our ESL students, this is the reason why we're giving that $8,000 incentives for the teachers to go and receive, to receive those $8,000 while they go to school so they can receive their certification in ESL to make sure that we're differentiating the instructions for our students and making sure that the right program is in front of our students. We also have the dual language program. The dual language program is also, is a 50-50 models that are being used uh, that uh, students will learn first in, in the primary language, if it's English or the primary language may be Spanish, but in the 50-50 model, every student will receive additional support in those programs in English and Spanish so they can continue to to develop their primary language as a, and then learning the secondary language. So we have to make sure that that's in place. So if the parent has not been aware of those programs, uh, it's important, Nick, that maybe that parent could uh, reach out to you personally and, and you uh, help this parent uh, navigate those waters to find out which is the program that the child needs as we move forward. All right, thank you for that, Superintendent. Uh, Janet, if you could record um, that particular ask and we'll follow up afterwards. All right, so the next question has to do with um, these uh, special, special needs students. Um, what will we be doing to support uh, that student population? That is a great question. And we are currently going through all of our special needs classrooms um, and um, observing programming for all of our special needs students, whether they're in a separate classroom or any classroom that, that we're in. Um, we are aligning this to our staffing plans for the upcoming school year. And it is also an area we're focused on uh, curriculum review. So we're looking at our in-school curriculum and our online support systems to meet students' needs throughout the district. We're also looking at um, taking care of our, uh, making sure that we have teachers and students with similar needs also to be near each other for additional support. Um, so we're making sure that when we have expertise in an area like autism, um, we don't have the only other program so far away that they can't support each other as well. So um, we're looking at all of the resources across the district. We're looking at our process for um, students enrolling in special needs um, and going for assessments, as well as making sure that our staffing um, models are correct, our classroom sizes are correct, our number of students in our classrooms are correct. 
So this is an endeavor that we're focusing on now and will continue in the uh, upcoming year. And we are spending a significant amount of dollars towards this because this is right in line with our LEAP priorities. And if, and if I may add, some of those funds are also being used as we are doing, uh, constructing new schools or like new schools or uh, going into certain buildings and uh, rebuilding the classroom. So it's, uh, we're looking at construction for instruction. Uh, and the reason why is because we're taking a deeper look at what the, the, the size of the room should look like for when we have students with, with uh, special needs or, you know, when we want them communicating with other students in the building. So when we're doing the constructions in the new buildings or like new buildings or any project that we're doing, that's one of the, uh, the asks that we're asking for when they, when they start building the new buildings or doing any constructions. All right, thank you, Superintendent. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Quick time check, we have about four uh, minutes left in the presentation. I will move to the next question. Will you be investing in school uh, atmosphere in terms of bullying and violence issues? Are you investing in any programs that can be taken in school, uh, in school class time or after school? So I'll start off and then Ms. Jackson, if you don't mind jumping in, but one of the programs that we're looking at that we've had it, it was uh, used uh, throughout the district at one point, not every school was using it, but it's PBIS and uh, we have, and that works with the social emotional needs of students, bullying students. So those are some of the pro that a program that we can be using and looking forward to trying to use. Uh, Ms. Jackson, would. Yes, and then uh, I, as I had spoken to earlier, we're also looking at um, the staffing that we have in each of our buildings. And that is again, um, making sure that we have social workers, we have our guidance counselors, we are adding our community specialists and we're adding behavior intervention specialists. You know, this is, this is the way that we can help students by ensuring that they have access to people that can support them um, wherever they are. And sometimes uh, if we tell students, no, don't do this, but then we don't also teach them what else to do, you know, we have missed an opportunity. So we want to make sure that we have the appropriate staffs in the building to support that. And so we are helping students grow um, and that we are making sure that, that children learn what other ways to communicate with each other. Um, and that, uh, and, and other ways that everyone in the building can communicate with each other. And that's a big part of PBIS. It's not just communication student to student, it's communication um, adult to student as well. All right. Yes, Superintendent. I also know that uh, some schools, and I know I was using some parts of it is restorative practice in the classroom and having conversations with more in the mornings, checking in with students. The teacher would check in two or three times throughout the day, just uh, when the students first come in, after lunch, and then before they go home, it was always a check-in, which is part of the social emotional support that was given the students. Uh, I know that was doing that. I don't know how many schools were doing that, but when I was a principal, we was doing some of it at uh, Leventon Dual Language. All right, thank you very much. We have time for one more question. Uh, before we get into that question, just a reminder, if you could go into the chat, there you will find a link to a survey where you can uh, provide uh, greater feedback uh, to the district. So please copy and paste and place that survey in your web browser. All right, so final question. Uh, how will these funds be used to support the sustainability of our pandemic strained educators? It's also part of the social emotional support that we're giving at the school level. It's not just for our students, it's as well for the adults. Uh, uh, so we know, we know the strain that this has not, you know, 
at, in, the, in the entire community. It's not just happening to one individual. Is we as a community need the support and we need the social emotional support that uh, that we're offering at schools. And so that is that is we have been working with it. We're going to continue to work with it. Okay, thank you, Superintendent. And with that, uh, we have reached the conclusion of the presentation. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, Superintendent Montañez, Dr. Montañez, thank you for joining us tonight, uh, the rest of the PPSD uh, team. And of course, all of you that have uh, given us an hour of your time uh, to share these uh, initiatives that the district is currently working on. Uh, one last reminder, we have another town hall tomorrow at 4.30. So we'll, we, we will be running from 4.30 to 5.30. We will use this uh, same uh, link as we did for this one. Uh, please feel free to come back or share uh, with uh, other families and community members. So thank you all. Uh, Superintendent, would you like to say a final word before we go? Uh, well, a few things quickly. First is please complete the survey. This is, this is going to help us as we move forward. And second, I've, I've always uh, asked that uh, right now is uh, we know we're kind of in the, uh, the pandemic and, and the, how many uh, individuals are uh, being contaminated with this uh, uh, virus. But um, I'm always asking, you know, to keep yourself safe, wear your mask, safety. One, two, make sure if you can get boosted, please get boosted. I know we continue to test students in schools. Uh, we have, we're asking that if you have not done so, uh, the permission slip to opt in for the students to get checked in school. So it's always thinking, I'm always thinking safety first. So please uh, do the best we can because it's not only saving us one another, but it's our community it's, as a whole. So thank you. and. Um, and thank you for spending time with us tonight and asking questions as we move forward. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.